This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Most people would consider those healthy food snacks. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is very real. We don't need to demonize a whole food group as we've done over the last 20, 30 years. Cow milk protein is meant for a cow. What's worse, wheat or sugar? So they're, they're both bad, of course, but sugar is just sugar. Wheat is a whole conglomeration of things. So wheat does all the bad things that sugar does, but it also triggers autoimmune diseases. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the health journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? In season one of The Shift, we explore the fascinating field of gut health and help you discover what is really going on with your digestion, microbiome, and health. The gut is amazing. Changes our concept of the human body. Become useless to the healthcare system. We're always shifting. Your genes are shifting, your microbes are shifting, everything is shifting. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. As we've moved through the series, we've talked about the fact that food is the number one thing that can impact our gut health. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Food is the primary thing we bring into contact with the microbiome and gut wall. Food reactions can occur for a number of reasons. I asked integrative gastroenterologist Dr Marvin Singh what type of reactions people can have to food. Food reactions can manifest in a like wide variety of manners. Um, sometimes this doesn't happen immediately. There's different kinds of food reactions. Everybody knows about, uh, for example, I guess peanuts is a good one to, to talk about because everyone's real familiar with peanuts and getting problems with like the can't breathe or tongue, lip swelling, things like that. That's more of what we call an IgE mediated response, which is uh, an anaphylactic type response, an immediate response. If you eat the peanuts, um, sometimes even if you touch the peanuts, you get this kind of severe immune reaction. What we're kind of talking about here is uh, more of a uh, delayed reaction. Sometimes people can uh, have symptoms even a couple days after eating a food. So, for example, uh, if I had a piece of bread in the morning, maybe I'll have something as simple as heartburn later in the day or uh, my joints start aching the next day or I get a headache. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have celiac disease. The celiac disease is an autoimmune condition. Condition, but you may have uh, immune reactivity or non-celiac gluten sensitivity is what, what the actual term is uh, in the case of uh, gluten. In the last episode, we talked about food allergy being on the rise, but food intolerance is also becoming far more common. You can see this in the explosion of the gluten-free movement. In celiac disease, we have a severe autoimmune reaction to gluten, and it affects about 1 in 70 to 1 in 100 people living in developed countries. But those choosing to eat gluten-free far surpass these numbers, with many people opting out of gluten because of the symptoms they get when they consume it. You'd be becoming familiar with Dr. Leo Galland by now, but to recap, he's an integrative doctor from New York City and the author of The Allergy Solution. I asked him what the difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance was. There are many mechanisms of food intolerance. Allergy is one. Allergy involves the immune system. It involves one of these four classes of immune responses. But food intolerance can occur through other mechanisms, some of which may be directly mediated by the microbiome and some of which by are mediated by digestive function. So the classic and best known example of this is lactose intolerance. People are not able to absorb lactose, which is a complex sugar that is found in milk. In order to absorb it, you have to be able to break it down to the two simple sugars that it's made of, glucose and galactose, and those are readily absorbed. Well, there are a lot of people who lack the enzyme to do that digestion. When they consume lactose, and there's usually a threshold level, the lactose passes undigested through their GI tract, 
Well, when it gets to the large intestine, there are 100 trillion bacteria there, and many of them are only too happy to digest the lactose, and they produce irritating gases. So you get diarrhea, you get gas, bloating. So that is a straightforward food intolerance that does not involve the immune system, and it is mediated by the microbiome. If you didn't have microbes in your large intestine, the lactose would be inert for you. I heard a presentation by a French pediatric allergist a number of years ago that children with lactose intolerance are more likely to develop milk protein allergy. And the reason for that seems to be that the irritating effects of all the acids produced by just having lactose intolerance then impacts on the microbiome and the lining of the gut, producing a kind of a leaky gut. And the children then get sensitized to the protein in the milk. So this is a situation in which an intolerance then leads to a true allergy. Okay, so a food allergy is an event that involves your immune system. This can range from mild to serious, with the most severe form being anaphylaxis. While many people have true food allergies, the bulk of reactions that people get from food is actually non-allergic. Since Dr. Leo mentioned it, let's take a look at dairy. Milk, an important food for the health of the nation. Dairy intolerance is increasingly common and certainly is one of the biggest issues that I see impacting on our gut health. You've probably heard of lactose intolerance. About 65% of people lack the enzyme to break down lactose, the primary sugar found in milk. This means you consume the dairy, it irritates the gut and your body wants it out of you, so diarrhoea quickly follows. If you eat dairy and then need to run straight to the loo, lactose is likely to be the culprit. The mistake that people often make is eliminating lactose but continuing to eat dairy. Thinking that lactose is the only issue, you may be consuming lactose-free milk or lactose-free yoghurt and expect that it will be the answer to your problems. But lactose isn't the only issue with dairy. Dairy also contains proteins such as casein, which are inflammatory and difficult to digest. People often don't realise that when they're drinking milk, they're getting protein, fat, nutrients, but also hormones. And unless you only consume organic dairy, you're also getting a dose of antibiotics each time you consume it. Conventional dairy farms are constantly milking their cows. They milk them when they're pregnant, and they also give them hormones like bovine growth factor so that they produce even more milk. Because of this, they are very prone to mastitis or infections in their mammary glands. This leads to the frequent use of antibiotics. The cows are then milked and you end up consuming the residue. Your microbiome then has to deal with this, as well as the hard to break down compounds in dairy. I'll be honest here, I've never really liked dairy. I've seen it cause so many issues for people, especially those that consume a lot of milk. I have never had a patient that felt worse as a result of moving dairy from their diet, but it can be a really difficult thing to do. For starters, we often have an emotional attachment to milk. I mean, we grew up on the stuff, didn't we? And it's so ingrained in our Western culture that a lot of us are eating it several times a day. Let's see what Dr. Tom O'Brien thinks of dairy. Oh, um, cow milk protein is meant for a cow. The protein molecule is eight times the size of human breast milk protein molecules. Goat milk is six times the size. Our bodies can't digest it completely. It'll break it down partially. It saves lives. There's no question it saves lives. But when you have an option for something else, you don't want to use the milk of other animals. If you have to use the milk of other animals, those that are more homogenous with human breast milk, meaning it's not as likely to trigger an immune response, are reindeer, donkey, and camel milk. Cow's milk, however, in my book, you'll see the studies on casein, which is usually about somewhere between 4 to 6% of the protein in cow's milk. Casein is really hard to digest. That's why bodybuilders like to take casein protein powders at night because they're hard to digest. So all night long, you're getting a little more protein, little more protein, little more protein. 
whereas they use whey protein before workouts because the whey protein is very easy to digest, right? But casein will cause B4, capital B number four, breach of the blood-brain barrier. You get a leaky brain when you take uh, casein. And just go to PubMed and type in casein and sudden infant death syndrome. And there are studies that theorize it's the breach of the blood-brain barrier from cow's milk that causes the inflammation that triggers SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, if there's nothing else in the world available, you feed your child cow's milk to survive. But you start dialing down what the options are. So you use the life jacket whenever you need it. But you look for options that are less allergenic, less likely to stimulate your immune system to try and protect you. Are there implications of eating dairy on gut health? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The inflammation that develops in the gut from food sensitivities can react, can be from any food. Doesn't matter what it is. The most common adverse reaction to food on the planet is to dairy. That's the most common. After that, it's wheat. Now, some of you might be like, wait a minute, you've just shattered my world by saying I can't have dairy, and now you're also going to take away wheat? Well, I'll let you make up your own mind. But what I can say is that wheat came up again and again and again when I spoke to the experts. And although staying off gluten is something I've been advocating for for years, I was shocked to learn just how detrimental this little grain could be for us. Dr. William Davis is a leading cardiologist and the author of Wheat Belly. Wheat Belly was received to wide acclaim and is one of the best-selling health books worldwide. It really shook things up and challenged the recommended dietary advice that we'd been told for decades. Needless to say, Dr. William knows a thing or two about wheat. I asked him specifically what effect wheat has on our gut. So consumption of modern wheat is incredibly disruptive over intestinal health. It starts with the amylopectin A that causes bacteria to ascend up from the colon into the ileum, jejunum, duodenum, and stomach. That is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that's amylopectin A. Then there's wheat germaglutinin that blocks the process of digestion and is highly toxic to the gastrointestinal tract. Anytime you have inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract, such as that induced by wheat germaglutinin, it cultivates candidal overgrowth, fungal overgrowth. So wheat and grain consumption is incredibly disruptive over intestinal health and results in such things as irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and of course, celiac disease. So there's an astounding list of gastrointestinal health conditions caused by wheat and grain consumption. But the good news is, of course, you eliminate wheat and grains and you have huge control of gastrointestinal health. Amylopectin A is a starch that is not broken down properly by the human body. While the focus on wheat is often about gluten, amylopectin A has a heap of health detriments, including increasing insulin resistance, increasing belly fat and upping your cholesterol levels. I asked Dr. Tom O'Brien what happens when we eat wheat. We now have a number of studies that show every single human does not have the ability to break down the proteins in wheat into amino acids to be absorbed and reused to build new cells. No human breaks down wheat completely. Now, how does the problem manifest? Hollon, H-O-L-L-O-N, and Fasano at Harvard published on this a couple of years ago. They took recently diagnosed celiacs, so that's people who are still eating wheat, uh, celiacs in remission for at least a year, People at Harvard diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity and people that had no problems with wheat, four different groups. And they checked all four groups. Every person gets intestinal permeability every time they're exposed to wheat. Now, people don't like to hear that. Oh, that's nonsense. No, it's not. Just read the studies. Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every seven years. Some cells regenerate really quickly, like the inside lining of your guts every three to five days. So you eat wheat for breakfast, you tear the lining of your gut, but it heals. 
You have a sandwich for lunch. You tear the lining of the gut, but it heals. You have pasta for dinner. You tear the lining of the gut, but it heals. Day after day after week after month after year after year until one day you don't heal anymore. Scientists call it loss of oral tolerance. When you don't heal, now you get pathogenic intestinal permeability, which is the gateway. So these macromolecules, these larger molecules that aren't digested, get through the intestinal permeable membrane into the bloodstream, activating an immune response to fight wheat. Now you have elevated antibodies to wheat. That happens in every human when you lose oral tolerance. When you make elevated antibodies to wheat, antibodies are special forces, soldiers. They're going after a specific target. In this example, it's wheat. They're looking for the enemy with a particular signature. It's a protein signature. So I say it's a green vest. So special forces are in the bloodstream looking for green vests. And when they see a green vest, they fire their chemical bullets, their cytokines, to destroy the green vest, the molecules of wheat. The problem is the protein signature that makes up the green vest is the same or very similar to the protein signature of your thyroid or of your blood vessels or of your cerebellum, just depending on your genetic vulnerability, where is special forces going to attack your own tissue, thinking it's the same signature as wheat. When we're trying to make a shift in our lives, all it can take is one small thing to set us in the right direction. Perhaps for someone you know, it could be listening to this podcast. My hope is to get this into as many ears as possible. So if you know somebody that's stuck and needs to make a shift, why not send them this podcast? It could be the one thing that sets them in the right direction. The shift! At this point, you might be thinking, but haven't we been eating wheat for hundreds of years? Why are we reacting so badly? Well, our ancestors would never have eaten the amount of wheat that we do now, given that they didn't have large-scale farming and processing like we do. In addition to that, the wheat that they did eat is nothing like the wheat that we're consuming now. Dr William Davis explains. So traditional wheat is four and a half to five feet tall, Modern wheat is about a foot to 18 inches or so tall. It has a thick stalk, has large seeds, has large seed head. This is the product of genetic uh, modification. Modern wheat has indeed been genetically changed, but not via genetic engineering. It's been changed by other methods, such as uh, chemical uh, mutagenesis, the induction of numerous mutations using chemicals or X-ray or uh, ultraviolet radiation, they change the genetics of modern wheat such that is now a semi-dwarf plant with many change characteristics, new proteins, many different kinds of uh, compounds in modern wheat. And that's why, so wheat has always been bad for humans. We know that for a fact from the anthropological record. But what modern genetics research did was amplify many of the problems of modern wheat. What are some of the problems that it has now and how is it different? So the gliadin protein within wheat, people say gluten, but it's really gliadin within gluten, is responsible for the autoimmune triggering. Of, it's responsible for causing diseases like type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. So the gliadin protein is very good at causing increased intestinal permeability, the first step in causing autoimmune diseases. There's wheat germ agglutinin. It sounds like gluten, but it's unrelated. It's called agglutinin because it, when it contacts blood, it causes clotting, agglutination. So wheat germ agglutinin is completely impervious to human digestion, and it passes through the human intestinal tract intact because you can't break it down. But in the course from mouth to toilet, it has very toxic effects on the human gastrointestinal tract, such as it blocks the release of cholecystokinin, the hormone that causes your pancreas to release pancreatic enzymes, the hormone that causes your gallbladder to release bile, it blocks that effect. So it causes disrupted digestion and it causes bile stasis, the step that the process that leads to gallstones. It's also highly toxic to the gastrointestinal tract. If I feed just a milligram, a speck of wheat germaglutinin to a rat, it destroys its intestinal tract. So the average American who consumes lots of healthy whole grains consumes 18 to 19 milligrams of wheat germaglutinin, this highly toxic gastrointestinal compound. There's amylopectin A. 
This is the complex carbohydrate that dietitians told us for years was good for us, not recognizing that it raises blood sugar higher than table sugar because it's highly digestible. There's phytates that block absorption of all positively charged minerals like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron. So if you consume two slices of whole wheat bread in a sandwich, about 90% of all the iron in that meal is blocked from absorption. That's why iron deficiency anemia is so common. We're told, of course, that grains are necessary for fiber and B vitamins and other nutrients, which is complete nonsense. Grain consumption causes nutrient deficiencies. Only General Mills gives you whole grain in all your favorite cereals, guaranteed. It's good for my heart. It's good for my weight. I feel good about giving this to my family. Just look for the G. What Dr. Williams says about wheat raising blood sugar higher than refined sugar is really interesting. So let's explore that a little. Wheat actually has a higher glycemic index than sugar. The glycemic index, or GI, of a food is an indicator of how much it raises your blood sugar when you consume it. The higher the GI, the less favourable for our health. In many cases, eating two slices of bread can raise your blood sugar more than eating a Snickers bar. Yes, you heard right. Table sugar, usually made from cane sugar and the stuff that we most commonly consume, has a GI of 68. White bread has a GI of 74, while whole wheat bread has a GI of 75. How crazy is that? But what if you don't get any gut symptoms when you eat wheat? Is it something that we need to be avoiding anyway? I asked Dr. David Perlmutter what you should do. Well, I don't think there's anybody walking the planet who doesn't need to look after his or her gut. There has been a pushback, as you mentioned, gluten, from the notion that uh, if you don't have uh, celiac disease, by all means, go ahead and eat all the gluten you want. Because there was a challenge to the notion of what is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, meaning that gluten can affect you even if you don't have celiac disease. And that was an inconvenient truth. Well, it turns out that last year, uh, researchers from multiple institutions, including Harvard, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a study demonstrating that, yes, as a matter of fact, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is very real. And many people who have reactions to gluten have extra intestinal manifestations, meaning the gut is not involved or might not be experienced. They can have joint problems, skin problems, cognitive issues, psychiatric issues related to gluten or related to other changes in the gut that might not necessarily be appreciated primarily in the gut. So it means that we've really got to expand what we recognize as being related to abnormal gut health to include areas throughout the body where those changes might be manifesting. Let's be honest here, giving up wheat is not easy. In fact, it can be very addictive. I asked Dr. William Davis why people have so much trouble giving up wheat. So we have to accept that in wheat is a protein called gliadin. And gliadin, so like all components of the seeds of grasses, we're unable to enzymatically digest them and break them down. So if I eat an egg or a pork chop, I break down the proteins into single amino acids. That's how we're supposed to consume proteins. If you consume the proteins in grains, seeds of grasses, you can't digest them. You can't break them down. So the gliadin protein of wheat is broken down into small pieces, but not amino acids. Peptides, four or five amino acids long. And these small peptides have opioid properties, oddly. They bind to the opioid receptors of the human brain. They don't make you high, They cause addictive eating behavior. They cause addictive relationships with food. It causes uh, behavioral outbursts in kids with ADHD and autism. It causes uh, auditory hallucinations and hearing voices in people with paranoid schizophrenia. It causes 24-hour-a-day food obsessions in people with bulimia and and binge eating disorder. In everyday people without those conditions, it causes uh, increased appetite and desire to eat more food. That's why people who consume grains will tell you they have a big plate of spaghetti and they're stuffed and they're almost painfully stuffed, but they're still hungry. It's unnatural to have that kind of 
incessant appetite. Lose the grains and all that goes away. While I agree with gluten needing to be removed for all humans, there is a movement where grains are being demonised completely. I think that for some people, grains definitely need to go, but are we being over the top? I asked nutritionist Angela Pye for her thoughts on the matter. I think the whole idea that grains are evil, they've got anti-nutrition or we can't absorb and digest them is just plain silly. I, there's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. We don't need to demonise a whole food group as we've done over the last 20, 30 years, right? I mean, it's, you know, fats are bad for you. Uh, no, they're not. Eggs are bad for you. No, they're not. You know, I think we can all agree on sugar. <laughs> so let's agree on that one because it's all the additives that are being put in are all, all agreeing on additives, but all whole foods have their place. It's an interesting point of view from Angela here, but I really believe that if we want to heal our gut, gluten has to go. But is going gluten-free the solution? What happens when we swap from wheat to gluten-free alternatives? Dr. David Perlmutter explained how this can sometimes raise another dilemma. I think that primarily the gluten-free foods uh, that people tend to gravitate when they go gluten-free tend to be really horrendous in terms of their carb content, high in sugar. And even, uh, you know, the relationship between gluten, I think, is number one, tangential, because the foods that contain gluten are typically grain-derived and as such, again, are going to be high in carbs. Carbs raise blood sugar. That's how you gain weight. Carbohydrate-rich foods, sugar-rich foods, were traditionally the signal to the human physiology that winter is coming. It turns on various proteins and enzymes that trigger the body to make and store fat. So uh, that really is this powerful relationship. When we also consider that gluten, and more specifically gliadin, part of gluten, uh, increases gut permeability in many people, if not all humans, the increase in gut permeability is linked to inflammation. Inflammation antagonizes or blocks the uh, ability of insulin to do its job when it binds to its receptor. So it antagonizes the insulin receptor. So higher and higher levels of insulin need to be created because insulin function is being blocked. That ultimately uh, leads to a situation called insulin resistance. And because of that, uh, ultimately, those higher levels of insulin uh, increase the production of body fat, but blood sugar rises as well because insulin ultimately becomes less effective. What is the end result of that for people? Well, you know, we understand that now body fat is far more than simply a storage depot of calories. Our ability to make body fat served us well in our Paleolithic time because it was this buffer against times of caloric scarcity. But body fat is far more than storage of calories. It's an extremely active endocrine tissue. Body fat, which is interestingly increased during inflammation, actually profoundly contributes to the inflammation itself, creating a feed-forward cycle. We know that these uh, adipocytes, which are the cells, uh, the fat cells, are very sensitive uh, to various stimuli in the body. We're just, for example, understanding how the endocannabinoid system is involved here, whereby stimulation of certain receptors, binding of certain receptors called CB1 receptors on these adipocytes or fat cells, dramatically increases inflammation, uh, reduces the production of, of mitochondria, elevates blood sugar, elevates uh, triglycerides, leads to increased fat storage, compromises energy utilization, and has a whole host of downstream effects that typify uh, what we see in modern humans, weight gain, increased inflammation. And I think this is a real cornerstone mechanism for the progression of these chronic degenerative diseases that we're seeing. From working with thousands of patients, I know that learning doesn't always equate to doing. For some of you, I know that you'll listen and take action right away. 
but for others, you're going to need a little more help. That's why I've developed my Gut Shift program. Over 12 weeks, I'll take you through what you need to make a shift in your gut health step by step. It's based on the latest clinical research combined with the clinical experience from seeing thousands of patients. Registrations are now open. Go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. The Shift! What's worse, wheat or sugar? So they're, they're both bad, of course, but sugar is just sugar. Wheat is a whole conglomeration of things. So wheat does all the bad things that sugar does, but it also triggers autoimmune diseases. It also causes, adds to dementia risk. It also adds to cancer risk. In other words, so wheat is worse, not to say that uh, sugar is good. So one lesson we have to remind everybody of over and over again because dietitians and people who talk about nutrition often don't understand, is that if something bad is replaced by something less bad and there's an apparent benefit, you should not conclude that a whole bunch of less bad thing must therefore be good. That was integrative cardiologist Dr. William Davis. It's interesting that while sugar has received so much press, wheat is still seen as a healthy food in most cases. You'll see it recommended by dietitians routinely and many processed products based on wheat are portrayed as healthy. But sugar definitely deserves its place on the wall of shame. It is a huge contributor to obesity and just about every other disease. But how does it impact our gut? Sugar is a simple carbohydrate. In the gut, your yeasts in particular feed on sugars. This is fine normally, but when we have more and more refined carbohydrates coming into the digestive system, it causes an overgrowth of fungal organisms. These then crowd out other beneficial species, leading to dysbiosis. In severe cases, CFO or small intestinal fungal overgrowth can occur. So ultimately, consuming too much sugar can damage our microbiome. I asked integrative rheumatologist Dr. Ailey Cohen what foods people should avoid if they're trying to help their digestive health. I mean, it depends on what they have going on, but in terms, I would say always say processed food. I know everyone knows not to eat fast food, right? I think that's kind of a given, but to me, it's the, it's the packaged stuff. It's the stuff that comes in plastic that you can reheat quickly, um, or the snack foods that you can reach for that when you're reading the ingredients list, you realize have way too much sugar, way too much salt, and not really enough in terms of nutrition. That's the stuff that we need to look at. It's interesting, I've done a, a, a video before looking at sugar that's coming in from healthy sources. And uh, Kind Bar was one of them, uh, Cascade Fresh Yogurt. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what the, the last one is. You know, and most people would consider those healthy food snacks, right? And so if you actually go through and add up the sugar in those and then figure out if the person ate those five days a week, what would that look like over the course of the year in terms of pounds? And it was 13 to 15 pounds of sugar. Just from those three healthy foods, not the ice cream that you went and dipped into, not everything else, just those three healthy foods. Like sugar, processed food is detrimental to our gut health. In the last hundred years, we've consumed more and more packaged foods. The more processed the food, the harder it is to break down and the more additives it contains. Processing significantly reduces the nutritional content of food. For example, milling grains removes 80% of the vitamin E, 60% of the B1, 50% of the B5 and 75% of the B6. Refined grains are a huge part of the modern diet. A lot of the bread, cereals, cakes, cookies, pasta and crackers you eat have the fibre and nutrient-rich husks removed. In the husks of grains, you'll find minerals like chromium and zinc that are needed to break down the carbohydrate within the grain. When you consume these white products, your body still has to break them down so you use nutrients from your body. This means that by eating refined grains, we lose nutrition instead of gaining it, essentially making them nutrient robbers. So not only do we have the issues of gluten and glyphosate that these grains contain, but they also strip our bodies of nutrition, making them a truly harmful food. We know that grains and sugars can impact the microbiome, but what about fat? Research is beginning to emerge in this area and is not very solid, but there is some clear evidence that fat does have the ability to modify our microbiome. The type of fat is important here. 
A recent mouse study found that mice that were fed hydrogenated soybean oil had significant alterations in their microbiome and an increase in inflammatory markers, as well as a decrease in the production of disease-preventing butyrate. Hydrogenated oils contain trans fats. You'll find these in things like margarine, deep fried food, fast food, and a lot of the processed foods that you consume. Some of our food is so processed that it can hardly even be classed as food. If you're eating fast food or processed foods regularly, then you're likely getting a heap of man-made chemicals such as emulsifiers, colours, flavours and preservatives. These non-food items cannot be broken down by your body and have a lot of detrimental health effects. By now you might be thinking, what can I actually eat? It can seem a bit overwhelming at first when you find out that you've been eating foods that have been harming you. But the good news is, if you can shift your diet away from these foods and replace them with something healthier, you will be healthier as an end result. In part two of this episode, we're going to explore a better way of eating and give you some ideas so that you can begin to make your shift. Coming up on The Shift. It's not about a diet. It's not about a wellness program. How much pesticides do you think that that gets rid of realistically? You're deciding, okay, I'm going to put this microorganism and this one together. I don't care if they play well together. I'm just going to put them in there anyway. There are some good carbs. So it's it's become clear that we need to revert back to old practices. So it's not difficult for people to eat healthy, right? No, I don't believe so at all. I hope you're loving the information in the shift as much as I do. But maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do for me? Take our online assessment to discover what your gut is up to. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz. The Shift! This series is produced by Must Amplify. Hosted by Catherine Maslin. Executive producer, Ronsley Vaz. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash gut. Still listening? We are so proud with what we've created with season one of The Shift, but there is more to come. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. The Shift! Thank you for listening. Every listen or download of this show and hence this voice directly funds the ending of sex and human trafficking. A voice for a voice. 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 Find out more at Amplify. Impacts. 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 Dot com. Dot com.